Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that is related to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be at this holy place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. Allow your inheritance in the name of of the covenant of blood to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break the chains of all evil and sin that holds us captive. May in the service be cursed all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, ignorance, covetousness, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people, and stand, O Lord, on the place of your rest, you in the ark of your greatness, and may your saints be clothed in your redemption, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit, fill us with your Spirit. Allow us to discover your shining countenance. I lay this service in your divine arms. Guide it with your uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. Спасение святую любовь, за наше спасение Христос пролил кровь. Да мир окупил он, да радость, покой, и мир наш наполнит хвалой. И Бог был он много, и Богом идет, но Божьи слова вдруг коснулись мосу, и сердце смирилось, и слезы не Христу, Аллилуйя, пою, я пою, Аллилуйя, Христу, я пою, Аллилуйя, Христу, я пою, я пою, я пою, Аллилуйя, Христу. Yeah, but...
And so before we continue to submerge into the depths of our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life and put on the new form of life that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness Ephesians 4.22 through 24 to fulfill this command we need to utilize as we know three charging and fundamental verbs these are to be put off be renewed and put on and to to confirm the given promise which in status is a required commandment as well as our purpose we will read another place of scripture where the same author in a bit of a different format speaks of the same truth calling us to take off the old man with his deeds so we can after put on the new man Colossians 3 8 through 14 but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Here we see the portrait of the old man that we need to cast off of ourselves, put off of ourselves. So we can then put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor un uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free but Christ is all and in all therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved put on tender mercies kindness humility meekness long-suffering bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you also must do but above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions to put off, put off, be renewed, and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the accomplishing of our salvation come to pass that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it forever and result then our names be forever blotted out of the book of life. In a specific format, we've already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the following question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that in is created in accordance to God and in righteousness and holy truth. And when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light, we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. Sp since prayer, as we know, isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God. Man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Relevant here is one of the prayers of David written in the 143rd Psalm. This Psalm very clearly opens for us the conditions, the grounds upon which a person is called to prepare a legal foundation for God so that God would intervene with his mercy into our life, intervene also within the boundaries of those aspects that we rule over and that we carry responsibility before God for. Let us now submerge into the flow of this prayer so that it would flow from our mouth to God. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. 
For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercies, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. Psalm 143, 1 through 12. For David, as well as for us, to hear the mercy of God, to hear it in the resurrection of the Son of God, we, like David, need to present to God legal grounds and a particular right. And such evidence in this prayer, as we already know, were ten unique in their nature arguments, identifying the right to enter the presence of God, founded upon the laws of God, which is also the word of God that comes out of his mouth. This word God has magnified above all his name, and this word he willingly submits to. <clears throat> Specifically, these ruling and mighty words of God converted into promises and commandments for man, David presented to God as the consistency of his heart, saying to God, Hear me in your faithfulness and your righteousness. Hear me because I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. Hear me because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me, for in you do I trust. Hear me because I lift up my soul to you. God wants us to tell him upon what foundation, why should he hear us. Hear me, for I lift up my soul to you. Hear me because in you I take shelter. Hear me, for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness' sake. And hear me, for I am your servant. In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument that abided in David's heart. This was evidence that faithfulness and righteousness abided in David's heart. This served as a legal ground for God, giving God the ability to hear David and to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies. And we stopped to study the second argument. This is the presented by David evidence that in his heart, the memories of the days of old were imprinted and all the deeds that God had done in those old days. Based on the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we began to study the form of evidence in the breastplate of the judgment of the high priest. This item is a unique and continual memorial before God, identifying with itself continual prayer. The breastplate of judgment, as we know, was created and served only one item. This was the unification of the Urim and the Thummim, the truth, the teaching of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit within the heart of a man, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and man to hear God. Therefore, to be heard by God in the revelations of his Urim, it was necessary to keep within your mind the works of God, that is, his Thummim, that God had done in the days of old. The breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God is a sacral symbol of the format of continual prayer, providing God grounds to fulfill his will upon planet earth. Therefore, prayer that does not satisfy the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer. And when people pray and it's not in accordance to the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment, God does not hear or listen to this prayer. Although people are satisfied with it, they think if they've expressed this prayer, a person often feels satisfaction when he expresses his need. But if God heard it or not is a 
different question, as only the format of continual prayer presented in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest gives us the right to come close to God and enter into the holy place as a king and a priest to God to present intercession that pursues the interests of his will. Here is how Apostle Paul presents the nature of the breastplate of judgment symbolizing continual prayer in his books. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. Continue, continually praying is communication with God that is not interfered with sin or by sin. When a person meditates about God continually and himself deeply meditates about God, you can talk to somebody else, but inside of yourself, you can ask God questions. We have that ability. <clears throat> we note that continuing earnestly in prayer identifies a joyously burning lamp. This is uh, Proverbs 13:9, uh, identifying the conditions of the righteous heart of a man. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. To be put out means it will be uprooted and will self-destruct. Self-destruction happens in the unclean. The unclean is a person that was previously holy, that whose lamp uh, burned brightly, but then he began to think and get uh, began to stir the idea of taking the position of God's delegation and when he's trying to take the position that that doesn't belong to him the scriptures uh, call these people unclean just like the uh, Lucifer who wanted the position of God and was thinking to take that position the order in which the breastplate of judgment was built identified and enjoined the demands of spirit and truth that the true worshippers of God, whom God seeks, need to be in accordance to and need to possess. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. If the building order of the breastplate of judgment is interfered, identifying the nature of the heart of a worshipper, the breastplate of judgment, would lose its nature and its purpose. Worshipping the Father in spirit and in truth included not peddling with the truth when pursuing the goals that God has placed in Scripture, as people have done at all times and many do today, because of their stiff neck and to benefit their greed and their hypocrisy. 2 Corinthians 2.17 For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ, Apostle Paul writes. In the Septuagint, this is the translation from Greek, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice, as by the means of the urim and the thummim that is contained in the breastplate of judgment, God revealed to man his judgments. By the means of the heart of a man, the Holy Spirit as the Lord in his heart and the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh that was present there, God was able to respond to man and man was able to hear God and ask him questions. Symbolically, the breastplate of judgment identified a conscience of a man purified from dead works upon the tablets of whom, just as a sign it, and the twelve names of the patriarchs, the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh was imprinted. If a conscience of a man will be purified, but it, a person does not bring in the teaching of Jesus Christ there, then the devil will come there. It is written that when a demon is gone, he leaves, cleansing happens, he uh, wanders about and then returns to see what happened to that house. If it is occupied with some kind of false interpretations, uh, partial truths, or some kind of religious conclave uh, understandings, but the teaching of Christ is not there, then the devil comes there and, and takes seven more. Uh, powerful than he is and this the devil begins to use this person's religious perversions uh, and begins to present them as commandments 
and will attempt to force others to think that same way. They will continue to uh, attempt to confirm that their understandings, things that are not in accordance to Scripture, will be the truth. This is very dangerous. A conscience purified of dead works with the imprinted faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets is called to give God the right to function in them and through them upon planet Earth. In a specific format, we have already looked at the measurements and nature of materials with which the breastplate of judgment was built that we are called to be in accordance to within our spirit and stop to study the next requirements that says, and you shall put settings of stones in it. The first row of serity is topaz and emerald. Second row shall be turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. The third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper. And they shall be put in gold settings, and the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engraving of a sign at each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes, Exodus twenty seventeen through 21. We've noted that the twelve golden settings where these precious stones, the twelve stones were to be placed, is the authority, rule, and order of the Word of God, containing in the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, that we as worshippers of God are called to present within the foundation of our continual prayer, as grounds in our continual prayer. So our prayer needs to be spoken according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. The twelve precious stones with engraved upon them as a sign at names of the sons of Israel is a symbol and format of our continual prayer, presenting the perfect judgments of God or perfect will of God. From this we can see that it wasn't the golden settings being the truth of the word of God that were adjusted in measurement and configuration to fit the precious stones, but the precious stones themselves being our prayers are the ones that were adjusted and configured to fit the golden settings of truth. <clears throat> Continual prayer in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the twelve names is a persisting prayer that in its intercession presents the interests of God and does not sway away or step away from the goal until what is asked for is received. Building of the breastplate of judgment within our heart is revealed as building the kingdom of heaven in the image of the tree of life, and growing the tree of life within our heart is building yourself up into a new person, created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. With this we will note that all the beauty and order of the temple was created for one holy item and served one item. This was the golden Ark of the Covenant. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest, <clears throat> with the connected to it breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to duplicate and fulfill the function of the golden ark. This was the Urim and the Thummim, because the golden ark of the covenant as well as the breastplate of judgment symbolized from different angles and with various purposes the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works. We know the Urim and the Thummim in Hebrew mean light and perfection. Light Light belongs to the revelations of the Holy Spirit and perfection, the teaching of Jesus Christ. Light and the right, light is the Holy Spirit, the right is Jesus Christ, or, or the teaching of Jesus Christ, or revelation is the Holy Spirit, and the truth, again, is the truth, the teaching of Christ. For example, the Ten Commandments inside of the Ark of the Covenant, symbolizing Christ, is the truth. And this truth upon the breastplate of judgment is the Thummim the teaching of Christ, the light revelation that a person could receive at the lid of the ark or the mercy seat of the covenant is the Urim and the breastplate of judgment. This is the Holy Spirit. A worshiper of God is a person who has a wise heart upon the tablets of whom the truth in the form of the Thummim is imprinted, within the boundaries of which the Urim in the form of the Holy Spirit could reveal the mysteries of the Thummim the mysteries of the teaching of Jesus Christ. I put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you, Exodus 31, 6. It's talking about the Holy Spirit that would become, be able to become the Lord of our life when there's wisdom in the heart. We can say as much as we want, Holy Spirit, I open my heart, enter in and be Lord of my life. But if in your heart you don't have the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, he cannot enter in there and be Lord. There's no place for him there. One person said to Jesus, Jesus, allow me to follow you. 
And he answered, you have, uh, uh, you have holes for the foxes and you have nests for birds in your heart. You can't follow after me. And for the other, he, to the other, he said the opposite, follow after me. But he said, allow me to bury my father. I need to fulfill the commandment, honor your father and mother. He responded to him, allow the dead bury their own dead and follow after me. In this way, he said that if your parents uh, are against the teaching of Christ, the truth, then they lose the right to be honored. You don't need to honor parents that hate the truth. You honor parents that love the truth and follow after Christ. If they say, I follow after Christ, but they don't accept the teaching of Christ, and if it's not, not enough that they actually resist it, then these parents are not honored because they're dead. Jesus sees them as dead. Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but you follow after me. God will never place his wisdom or his Holy Spirit as the Lord into the heart of a foolish person. That is how the scriptures call a foolish person, one who does not have the teaching of Christ. Whatever knowledge you may have obtained in the world, you can finish any uh, institute or college, you can receive a great status uh, of theology, but there they don't teach you the teaching of Jesus Christ there. They teach you the history of Christianity, they teach you uh, about other theologians and how they understood the scriptures, this one understood this, this one understood this, and all of these understand differently, and they say you also can present your own understanding and you will receive a doctorate in theology. If you can imagine... Uh, you, uh, if you present an understanding of your own and find a way to back it up, you will then be able to receive a doctorate in theology. One man became angry at me and says, who are you that you're saying uh, things against doctorates of theology? I, I said, in this book, there's no doctor, uh, doctors of theology in this book. There's apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. I, I said, is, is, do you understand what I'm telling you? There, there's no such thing in this Bible. And the teaching that the Lord presents, he presents not in a college, but in a church. The church is that house, that place where the Lord will reveal himself. A college is not that place. I'm not against colleges. People created colleges. But I repeat that, as one Episcopal said, when he came, came to America and went to church and said, Brother Arkady, you present such wisdom, he heard me speak, you need to present in a college, not in a church, the church won't understand you. I said, did you understand what I said? He said, I think I did. Then I said, if you understood, then the church will definitely understand. This is for her. And what? They understand what you say? I said, yes. And if there's something they don't understand, they put it upon their table of showbreads. The friendship of the Thummim and Urim in the heart of a person is a unification of two formats of wisdom, which state that the carriers of the Thummim and the Urim are true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 33, 8-11 and of Levi he said, We know that every name upon the breastplate of judgment symbolize the name of God and demonstrate the name of God and our name as well that belongs to us. And Levi has this destiny that we also need to possess. God wants us to possess being binded to God, being dependent from God, being led by the Holy Spirit. And of Levi he said, Let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who say of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the works of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise up against him and of those who hate him that they rise not again. 
<clears throat> as soon as Moses confessed these words, he in this way confirmed these words and they became law. In a specific format, we have already looked at five qualities of a warrior in prayer and the five, first five precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, by which God was able to continuously reveal His will upon planet Earth, and stop to study the sixth quality and the precious diamond stone. We know now that the sixth name carved upon the precious stone of the breastplate of judgment is the name of the sixth son of Jacob, Naphtali, which means wrestler. And Rachel's maid Bela conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali, one who prevails in prayer, who allows God to battle with him in prayer against those things that infer, interfere. Genesis 37, 8. The name of God presented in the precious diamond stone, according to the Jewish rabbinate, is El Hai. In Hebrew, which this translated means God is alive. Therefore, according to the definition of the name Naphtali upon the precious diamond stone, we can see the function of the sixth principle as a format of continual prayer is our right and ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell, which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God. But the Lord is the true God. He is a living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble and the nation shall not be able to endure His indignation. Jeremiah 10.10 10. The name of the living God is a format of an oath and the category of the nation that had not learned to swear by the living God or swore falsely were utterly destroyed. Jeremiah 12, 16, 17 And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Therefore, to not be plucked up and destroyed by the wrath of the living God, it is necessary to learn the ways of the nation of God, to swear by the name of God El Hai, or by the living God. These ways are the paths of the commandments and statutes of God. The conditions that give us the right to learn the ways or paths of God's commandments and statutes, so we can swear by the name of the living God is the thirst to know them. Psalm 119, 32 through 35. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart when my heart will begin to bear fruit. The fruits of righteousness, then I will be able to run the course of your commandments. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. And so this is a king, a prophet, a diplomat. He did not rely upon his own mind. And he didn't turn to the Sanhedrin to learn from them, but said to God, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. We know that in Hebrew, the name of God, El Hai, or living, means one who abides, one who is, with unconditional authority, one who defines a genesis, creates a genesis, holds a genesis, keeps a genesis, and rules over the Genesis, and also commander and lord of the Genesis. Deuteronomy 10, 20, and 21. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oath in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. You remember in Matthew it says, Do not swear by heaven or earth, because people were afraid to swear by the name of the living God. The, the Jews were afraid to even pronounce the name Yahweh. They replaced it with the name Adonai and they began to swear by heaven and earth instead of God and that's why he said to them do not swear by heaven or earth because it was necessary to swear by the name of the living God it doesn't say don't swear by the name of the living God because some say we can't swear by anything 
And so what is swearing? That is an expression of what you trust upon or rely upon. I trust upon the name of, my, of the living God. And so if you swear by his name, when the prophet said, the Lord lives before whom I stand, this was them swearing by his name. The power of a warrior in prayer contained within the virtue of the name of the living God is called to present the unlimited power of God over the Genesis in the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Therefore, it was necessary for us to look at and determine what goal God has in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. Also, in what way and upon what conditions is God able and desires to give man the right to become to have the name Israel to become a warrior in prayer so that man may present the interests of God and implement his inheritance in God. For the definitions provided in Scripture, to be a warrior in prayer is a lawful and privileged inheritance of holy men of all days. This is their primary or first most purpose that is revealed in their calling, to trample upon uncleanness and the unclean in their prayer battles as dirt in the streets. This is one of the greatest positions that is gifted by God to man, in which a person becomes a king and a priest to God and is seen by God as a brilliant diamond stone with the name of Naphtali. Not being a king and a priest to God in the virtue of which a person receives the unique ability and right to reign with his informational organ over his emotional organ, it is impossible to be and remain a warrior in prayer. Mostly people are led by emotions and their mind serves their emotions. But that's not how it's supposed to be. The inform informational organ is called to reign over the emotional aspect of the soul. This is the renewed mind of man, renewed by the mind of Christ, that we are called to rule with over the emotions, the will. The prayer of a warrior in prayer is a sacral or holy mystery that has an unearthly genesis. By its nature, the genesis of prayer, as well as the genesis of God, does not have a beginning and does not have an end. <clears throat> prayer is the language of God, identifying the essence of God, the word of God, and the genesis of God. Prayer has always been the mystery of God, as it has always existed in the presence of God, as his golden scepter of favor. Prayer is the means of communication between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it is that golden scepter of favor which he stretches forth to the one that would seek his face in performing his will. If, however, anyone dared come to him upon his own personal conditions, not being called into his presence, then God's golden scepter of favor would not stretch forth to the one asking, and this would result in the prayers of this person being unheard by God. John 9.31 Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. The Holy Spirit, when he trembled and he hovered over the waters and he waited for God to express his words, his revelations, he was seeking the will of God. And then God stretched out his golden scepter to him and said, let there be light. And the Holy Spirit was able to fulfill the will of God and resurrect the planet Earth. When he said light, you know that in Hebrew and in other languages, light is also resurrection. Light is resurrection. And so God in this moment resurrected the Earth, the pla planet Earth, and all minerals beca became living or alive. The Earth consists of billions and billions of minerals that people, even those men of study, are not able to even count or classify. These precious minerals, also the 50 uh, precious stones, also minerals, and aside from these, there are also many other minerals, and they take part in the uh, plant life and also then animals and people as well. And a person is also made of these minerals. In a person you'll see all of these minerals, including silver and gold. And so when people were being killed in at the time of World War II, uh, they, uh, and they burned their bodies, 
uh, uh, they would actually gather up these precious uh, minerals. And so this body is eternal, although it may be destroyed, it is still eternal. And so when we will be in the new heaven and new earth, our body will be of a different uh, consistency, it will be spiritual, it will still be material, but it will be and so when Jesus appeared to them after he was uh, raised from the dead and then came to visit them if you remember they were afraid of him because he was a spirit but he allowed them to touch him and he they felt his body as it is physically and if you remember Thomas he told Thomas put your finger into the wounds of my hands and he did and he felt it and he believed and he said it's good that you saw and believed but blessed are those who do not see and believe because God greatly values the faith of men when they hear the word the right to come close to and stand before God is the ex exclusive prerogative of God. No one will be able to or will dare by themselves come close to God, the God that desires to abide in darkness or mystery or in the unapproachable light. Jeremiah 20 or 30, 21, 22. Who can approach God? Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledges his heart to approach me, says the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. To come close to or to approach God is the task of one governor that will come from and already came from the nation seed of Abraham. This is the only begotten Son of God and the status of the Son of Man, in whom and by whom anyone born from God and seeking God would be able to approach and enter God's presence. According to the revelations written in Scripture, our prayer in the quality of a warrior in prayer, identified in the brilliant stone, and not just the brilliant stone, but all of the precious, not just the diamond stone, but all of the precious stones, when we finish all of these ten virtues, it will be easier for us to study the next precious stones because pra practically these ten that we will list, they belong to all of the precious stones and not just the diamond stone. And our prayer needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. In the previous service, we in a specific format have already looked at seven components of continual prayer and stop to study the eighth component. This is the fruit of joy. We've noted that the fruit of joy in the heart identifies the state of a heart of a warrior in prayer as well as the quality of this warrior's prayer. As it is written, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Proverbs 17.22 Therefore, one of the signs by which we need to determine the presence of joy that comes from above will be a merry heart that will serve as a medicinal substance healing and restoring and repairing his faith and his trust in God. <clears throat> when it's written that a merry heart does good like medicine, medicine not for sicknesses but for the faith. Many people's faith is sick and that's why they can't receive healing. God needs to not give them healing from their sickness but heal the faith of a person. And the faith of a person is healed by a merry heart <clears throat> and it serves as a medicinal substance healing and restoring and repairing his faith and his trust in God broken spirit is a symbol of a hard heart that is directed by the pride of his unrenewed mind where there is an absence of an atmosphere of upright joy one depriving God of grounds or foundation to do good and heal this person 
And to determine the essence of unearthly joy as well as the conditions that we are needing to fulfill so that we can grow and begin to reveal its presence in our prayers, we've, ne we've been needing to study four classical questions, defining the essence and purpose of the fruit of joy in prayer, the price of obtaining and expressing the fruit of joy, keeping and developing the fruit of joy, the fruits and rewards of expressing upright joy in prayer. In a specific format, we have already looked at the first question, what qualities does supernatural joy have and what purpose is covered in the spring from which the unearthly joy flows. We conclude that in scripture the quality or character that is included in the word joy, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in prayer as a commandment, as a decree and order, and as an urgent military command that is to be fulfilled without deviation. If this order is not fulfilled, the verdict is death and a final separation or split from God. Apostle Jude, concluding his short book to the Church of Christ, gave the quality of joy its own elevation and rank as an integral part of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude 124. Looking at the above mentioned place of scripture, we can conclude that the that for God, fault or blemish in joy is an absence of a foundation keeping us from stumbling into perdition to present us before his glory. The glory of God abides exclusively in the atmosphere of upright joy and is an expression of upright joy. Blemishes or sin and joy is a stain or flaw revealing impurity, abomination, and deceit. A person who has not rid himself of such blemishes and joy, as well as in all of his other characteristics, will not be allowed into the holy Jerusalem, into heaven. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelations 21, 27. Determining the wellspring of unearthly joy and the existing in this joy natural qualities, we conclude that upright joy in prayer can come only from an upright heart of a man. By its consistency and the expressions, of this joy. Our words and our actions manifest a state of upright joy. If within our heart we will abide within the atmosphere of upright joy, then our prayer will express this joy. We need to differentiate earthly or regular joy from joy that is supernatural. The supernatural joy has its distinctive roots in God, its distinctive wellspring in God, and its distinctive genesis in God. By themselves, the two natures of joy are two programs that come from different nature springs, God and the fallen cherubim. The heart of a man is a programmable system that, and that nature of joy to which man gives his consideration and preference dresses him and rules in his essence. And if we consider or prefer earthly joy, then it from one side will be the means we measure our relationship with God and, and from the other side will be suppressing and depressing supernatural joy. If we will consider the joy that comes from above, then it also will be the means by which we measure our relationship with God. But due to its supernaturalism, unearthly joy is not able to be experienced or, or felt upon the level of our physical abilities, as unlike worldly joy, it isn't a kind of emotion or a kind of feeling that lifts your mood. Supernatural joy is a kind of discipline of the mind and heart, which creates peace in the heart of a man, as well as balances, controls, and leads our feelings. And when these feelings will be restrained with the discipline of the renewed mind and will of man, then his feelings will be able to experience the good and the medicine of his joyful heart, which is a wellspring of unearthly joy directed towards eternal life. Therefore, upright joy as a component of prayer is the confessions of the faith of the heart, confessing who God is to us in Christ Jesus and what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and such confession of the faith of the heart Heart in power will be equal to the power of the word that comes out of the mouth of God. Turning our attention to the unique wisdom of Scripture in defining unearthly joy, we've decided to look at the virtues of upright joy only within the heart of a man, born from the imperishable seed of the word of truth abiding within Christ. The example and criteria identifying the quality and nature of upright joy is God himself.
Therefore, this upright joy is not only the quality of God and the atmosphere in which God abides, it is also one of his glorious names with which he triumphs over his enemies. Psalm 43, 4, 5, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, God my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So, often, when I turn to my soul, when I feel some kind of doubt and dis- or disappointment, when I turn to my soul, you, speak, you need to speak to yourself when, this, uh, when you have sorrow and you don't know what to do. Tell your soul, why, why are you disquieted within me? I will praise my Lord and my God, because no one w- who is next to you would be able to tell you these things. Speak to yourself and you'll see results. So question two, what requirements do we need to fulfill to obtain and demonstrate the fruit of joy in prayer before God? The method by which joy is obtained in prayer or the payment of any price is made is in the very prayer itself, since prayer is not just the means of communication or the means of conversation with God, but also the means used to get to know God, and God abiding within the heart of a man is the wellspring of joy. Being crucified upon the cross, Jesus turned to his Father with this, with this prayer, but now I come to you, and these things I, I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. John 17, 13. To have in yourself full joy, it is necessary to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> not in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. John 16, 24, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I've heard many people who pray in this way, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my God, our God, <clears throat> don't start your prayers with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can be inherited only in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, if you want to have my joy and have it in full, you need to pray to the Father in my name and you will see this in Scripture. In the New Testament, you will not see any apostle that they turn in prayer to God calling God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, the blessings, we do inherit them. Lord God, thank you that in Jesus Christ I can inherit the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but through Jesus Christ. Therefore, the means and instrument for receiving and developing supernatural joy within yourself is continual prayer that is done in accordance to the 12 requirements that are contained within the 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment mounted into the 12 golden settings of the true word. Therefore, any element contained within the price for obtaining unearthly joy is called to be accomplished in continual prayer and by continual prayer, satisfying the requirements of the breastplate of judgment. In a particular format, we have already looked at seven elements necessary for receiving and expressing upright joy in the art of our continual prayer. Therefore, we will, we will immediately turn to study the eighth element. The eighth element in the price for receiving and demonstrating within yourself upright joy and continual prayer consists in the requirement to have the state or atmosphere of wilderness and wasteland within your heart. Isaiah 35, 1 through 10, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Even with joy and singing, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeeming, redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. We've noted more than once that the allegory regarding the wilderness is a symbol of a total sanctification, where the heart of a person in the form of his conscience is cleansed from dead works. The wasteland is a symbol of a heart that thirsts for righteousness. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. A heart that thirsts for righteousness is a heart that thirsts for the revelations of truth, abiding within the heart that can be accomplished by receiving the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 37 through 39. If a person will not thirst, then his heart, if his heart is not thirst, if it's not dry, <clears throat> then it also cannot be glad when he will have this uh, condition of uh, dryness and thirst and will turn to God to receive this water of life, then will he receive it. The ninth element in the price for receiving and developing within yourself upright joy and prayer is the necessity, like Abraham and Sarah, who bore us to look to the rock from which we were hewn and the hole of the pit from which we were dug. Isaiah 51, 1 through 3, we're talking about the price. Paying this price, we can then grow the fruit of joy. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone. Look at them because they looked at the rock from which they were hewn, and they looked at the hole of the pit from which they were dug. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah 51, 1 through 3. We've more than once noted that we are created by God with such a speciality that all that we will focus our image thinking on will transform us into its image. As it is written, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory when we look at the unseen and not the seen while we do not look at the things which are seen but those that are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things for which which are not seen are eternal what is this rock the rock is Christ and the hole from which you were dug God, carve, uh, we were hewn from Jesus, and we rose from death. To arise is to resurrect. To be born is to resurrect from the dead. To resurrect, you need to be in the depths of this hole, of the pit. This is a symbol. In other words, when we look upon who God is to us and in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us, we transform into the image of His Son, whom He made our justification. Tenth element in the price for receiving and developing within yourself upright joy in prayer is denying your nation, your house, and your life in the flesh. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In the given parable, the treasure of salvation, which is the kingdom of heaven, is presented in the heart of a man as a guarantee which we need to obtain by paying the price of everything we have. Watch therefore, this is Matthew 25, 13 through 21. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. 
These goods are the treasure that's buried in the field of our heart. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents, and likewise he who had received the two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so to be able to enter into the joy of the Lord, it is necessary to turn this silver of salvation to profit. In the above-mentioned parable, faithfulness over a few things consists in the loss of our nation, our house, and our fleshly life, providing God grounds to lead us into the inheritance of His upright joy. A person who died in his heart for his nation, for his house, and for his fleshly life becomes a possessor of a good heart or a possessor of the good soil and such possession is great gain as the good heart is a heart that is godly and content he purchases a uh, field in this way now godliness with contentment is great gain first timothy 6 6 he purchased this field he sold everything and purchased this field so if a person has not died for his nation for his house and for his fleshly life even if he doesn't think about salvation, he will lose it and his name will be blotted out of the book of life. Only after a person will be will fulfill and sell everything he has, only then can he turn to profit, pay the appropriate price for his field or turn to profit that talent which he was trusted with. And then he will enter into the joy of the Lord. Eleventh element in the price for demonstrating within your heart the fruit of upright joy in prayer is the necessity to accept various trials so that they test our faith in a way that our faith would produce the fruit of patience that would lead us to perfection in all fullness, lacking nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it, all, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. For us to be able to be joyful with a boundless joy during the testing of our faith with trials, it is necessary to receive grace from God, which is the strength of God producing the celebration of victorious joy during great trials. Moreover, in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, is what Apostle Paul writes about the Macedonians. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you pretty much more what he's saying here is I want to make it known to you to make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia that in the in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality and so in some way, this uh, overabundance of joy comes with liberality. If a person has greed and he's possessed with money or bound to money, he will never be able to be joyful. But when a person is freed from the slavery or servitude to the silver, to money, because this is a, a great slavery of men. A person is freed, he is overfilled with joy and not looking at the poverty, he will be uh, rich in, in, in joy and he will be so 
joyful in this manner. Twelfth element in the price for receiving and demonstrating upright joy in the creation of our continual prayer consists in finding the revelation of the word and putting it into yourself or receiving it into yourself. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. An amazing place of scripture, Jeremiah 15, 16. If you paid attention, the ability and power to find the spoken words of God of hosts and to eat them is the result of us being called by the name of God of hosts. Why was he able to obtain and eat his words and why they were not as a sorrow but joy for him? Because the name of God was upon him. He said the name Lord of hosts was upon, uh, I am called by. Therefore, only those people called the name of, of the God of hosts can receive the power and right to find or obtain the spoken words of God, which is food for their new person born to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. Your name, when you say, I'm called by your name, when he says, I am called by your name, called by means give your name. This is in Hebrew, be called by your name. Call someone to act in accordance to your name. Proclaim as your own personal belonging or your holiness. Read aloud the right and power of your name. When God calls us by his name, he reads aloud the right and power of his name, proclaims us as his personal belonging, and calls us to act in accordance to his name. Not possessing the power and authority of the name of God of hosts, it, it will be impossible to obtain the revelation words spoken by him to be able to eat them and in doing so identify with him in his word. When he says to find, as it, we read, I found your words, the words you were that were found and I ate them. To find is to bring to the meal table, to pursue, using all means and strength, to discover on your way to God. Find the revelations of the word in meditation, to be found or discovered by God, to obtain the inheritance of the word with the price of your life, to discover yourself in the words of life, to present the interests of the will of God, to satisfy <clears throat> the requirements of holiness, to obtain for total possession of, to be sufficient in God, to be caught into the nets of the confessions of the faith of your heart. <clears throat> we need to ask the question, what do we need to do or what conditions do we need to fulfill to be called the name of the Lord of hosts? Only this name upon us gives us the right to find and obtain God's word. We know that the word Yahweh of hosts demonstrates the unchanged in Hebrew title of God. The word hosts in Hebrew, Tsevaot, is the numerous number from number uh, from a numerous number of, of an army or number of members in an army of the king which are the multitude of legions of angels. Therefore, the title Yahweh of hosts means Yahweh of heavenly armies. Looking at this, the name Yahweh of hosts that prophet Jeremiah was imprinted with spoke of power that Jeremiah received from God over angels. And so, in order, we will not be joyful with the word we hear if we will not have power, receive, or we won't receive power. But when you uh, don't have this power, when you hear the word, you will be sorrowful because you know that you need to lose this, this, and this, and this, and deny things. But when you have this power given, 
over angels, you will be joyful for the privilege to do so. Specifically, power of the heavenly armies contained in the name of God Yahweh of hosts gave Prophet Jeremiah the right and power to obtain the spoken word of God or bring the spoken word of God to his meal table. But when he, he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirit, spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Hebrews 1, 6 through 7. I trust that we are now well aware that the power of God in his name, Yahweh of hosts, was given only to those holy people that in their relationship with God fulfilled the role of a helper. When it wasn't God that was the helper, but man here was the helper. There are positions where, or times when a person is the helper and other times when God is the helper. The name Lord of Hosts is a person being a helper of God. The priests, followers of the law of Moses, power of the name of God, Yahweh of hosts, was identified in their headwear from linen. To enter the presence of God without this headwear or headpiece made of linen meant immediate death. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread, you shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the sash of woven work. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make a ha make hats for them for glory and beauty so you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him you shall anoint them consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests and you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness that they should they shall reach from the waist to the thigh they shall be on Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come to near come near the altar to minister in the holy place that they do not incur iniquity and die it shall be a stat statute forever to him and his descendants after him Exodus 28 39-43 understandably the law of Moses with all its regulations statutes and commands was a symbol of the new things to come founded upon the new covenant with God in Jesus Christ for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things can never with these some same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect Hebrews 10 1 looking at this symbol if we as the priests of God will not have upon our heads a covering from linen we will not have the right to call upon God and enter into the presence of God and this covering made of linen was a symbol of a person accepting over himself the delegated power of God in the time of the law of Moses for each priest the delegated authority of God the person placed by God was the high priest and for every high priest that came from the line of Aaron, the delegated authority of God, the person that God has placed, was Moses. For Moses himself, the power or authority over him was God. He also had delegated authority over him, but God then made him authority, and the rest, it was Moses that dedicated Aaron and his sons and so you see this uh, these levels of authority here therefore all of the people of Israel men and women alike that did not come from the line of Aaron it was forbidden for them to cover their heads at the time of prayer anything of covering uh, made of linen or anything else it was equal to dying and so women in the nation of Israel did not have a covering on their heads and men didn't either even the Levites did not have this covering but just the sons of Aaron and only at the time when they would enter into the holy place when they would come out of the holy place they needed to remove this headpiece and remove the priest's garments and put on their own garments they didn't have the right to even come out of the holy place or out of the temple in this in these garments they were wore, worn only at certain times when they were in the temple we are priests 24 hours a day and we don't need to enter put it on and then come out and take it off we need to continually have the name of the Lord of hosts this covering of linen upon us we know in the New Testament this covering of linen testified of the fact that a person in the time of prayer fulfilled the role of a helper of God and this was demonstrated not in a physical headpiece but accepting authority over himself 
this person can be either a man or a woman because in Jesus Christ there's no male, there's no male or female a person cannot approach God fulfilling the role of just a male or just a female to be able to enter to God you need to fulfill two roles at the same time to fulfill the role of the female as the helper of God means to have the good soil of the heart cap able to receive the seed of the word of truth. At the same time, fulfilling the role of a male means confess the faith of your heart with your mouth. In this way, the ability to accept the seed of the word of truth belongs to the heart and the ability to confess the faith of the heart belongs to our mouth. Without the unification of these two roles, not a single person, a man or a woman, will not be able to inherit salvation. That is that great and perfect peace of God. When we confess with our mouth, we fulfill the role of a male. We are the, this is the seed. And confession is to be made by man and woman. But when we receive the preached word about the kingdom of heaven, both men and women, we fulfill the function of the female. Only fulfilling these two roles, a person can inherit salvation and the kingdom of heaven. In the book of Romans, the unification of these two roles is spoken in such a manner. Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus has raised him from the dead, to confess with your mouth and believe with the heart, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And now from the position showing the order of theocracy looking at the position of helper with the headpiece of the priest upon you, we will read 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 12. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or, sh or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But a woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through the woman. But all things are from God. 1 Corinthians 11, 3-12. And so the translators added it here that the woman is to have a covering over her head. Uh, in the original it says she needs to have a sign of authority upon her head, authority over angels, uh, a sign of uh, that she has authority over angels upon her head. When we receive uh, and believe with the heart the word of God, then this received word but with faith it uh, rules over angels and when the angels hear this word the confessions of the faith of the heart they're obedient to that word when we speak angels immediately stand uh, listening they wait for the confessions of the faith of the heart when Paul finished this chapter he, he said I am writing of spiritual things. Who is spiritual? Let them understand. A lot of unfortunate things have happened in the nation uh, of Christianity or Christian nation. They didn't understand about, they didn't understand of the covering. Uh, they, they physically forced their women to cover their heads with, with a, a cloth or a hat or something. And if she's not covered, she shames her, uh, she shames her head. And how many women I've, 
I've seen with their head covered who shame their husbands physic literally these were women with controlling spirits a religious person is generally a person with a controlling spirit imagine if she thinks it's the will of God but it's not the will of God this is a dead faith that she has and it's a controlling spirit she in some way will continually affect the husband always be unhappy to, and the husband to make her happy will need to be doing something to make her happy and so here we need to understand it's not talking about uh, literal uh, hair or coverings on your head this is talking about women naturally have uh, hair but this was taken as an example uh, uh, as delegated uh, accepting the, the delegated authority over yourself for a man or a woman in the church, the delegate authority is the pastor. In the in the family, the husband is is the authority, and for children, mother and father. But the children don't uh, wear coverings on their heads. They're obedient to the parent. I'm, I'm 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 coming from where they say that women need to cover their head because they're obedient to the husband. But children all. all their children all your children also obey you uh, so you need to put coverings in on their heads as well <clears throat> and boys and girls um, <clears throat> and and you will see in families how little girls even at very very small ages already are forced to wear these coverings on their heads and they don't understand the name of the Lord of hosts that should be upon her if she'll accept God's authority over herself or delegated authority you you can have a, a, a cloth in your head but not actually uh, accept God's delegated authority over yourself so you will not actually have that covering that lo the Lord spoke of we don't need to obey uh, our pastors or our husbands or any authority out of the boundaries of scripture when a person because of an unclean life uh, become a stumbling block and uh, put burdens upon others that they don't, themselves don't want to carry uh, <clears throat> who always talk about how a wife needs to treat her husband, but don't talk about how the husbands to treat uh, their wives. These are husbands you shouldn't listen to, but listen to the pastors that only the Lord has placed, who are an example that we can look at and say, I want to be like this. I want to live like he lives. I want to know how he communicates with God. One young man Found, found out that I have my own secret room or, or just a, a separate room where I go. We have a temple within our heart. This is our room. But we always find a place that uh, is separate from, uh, that is in independent, where there's no other people. So we can go and pray there. And I had my own little place that I'd like to go. In my apartment, I would go there to that place. And as soon as I go there, I'd go into the presence of God. And this person uh, followed me. And when I left from this place, he was sitting in the bushes and watching. And I didn't know that he was there. It was outside. And I was walking and meditating and praying. And when I left, he went on to this place where I was praying. And he told me what happened. He said, in my life, I never experienced such great presence of God such a great presence of God when I came on into that place where you were. But in scripture say, why are you uh, being warmed at the fire of another? Don't you want your own fire, your own place? Yes, you went there, but this wasn't your place. You need to have your own, your own separate room, your own temple where you need to pray. This is very important that when your children look at you, that they have fear that my mom left the Lord or came to the Lord. I'm, I remember one of my sons had uh, had told me a couple things. I won't do this anymore. I won't do this. He wasn't very happy. He was. I was. He was very upset at me and didn't eat and drink for many days. 
and didn't even go to school. And I quietly just walked around and prayed. And I came out and was praying in that very place I usually went. And God's revelation came upon me, presence, and he said, I gave you victory. I came to into his room and uh, told him, you're going to do this and this and this. He stood up, cried, and then hugged me and said, forgive me, and I won't do this again. And it was fixed. If you find God's presence and truly will enter there, do these things, then you will truly be able to captivate your children as well. You won't panic. You will proclaim and tell the devil it won't work. He is with me and he's saved. Right now we are going to pray and thank God for the fruit of joy that we have heard about, for the conditions that we need to fulfill. Every one of us is able, he, he, you hear it, you can fulfill it, and when we fulfill it, then we will be filled with an un unusual uh, joy that you will uh, then overcome the enemy with. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bend my head together with your people. I bow my head together with your people upon this holy place that you're, you have appointed to worship your holy name so that your glory be here for, so you here can give your revelations so that you can seal your name upon the foreheads of your holy ones. I pray that the name of the Lord of hosts be upon every holy person that hears these words, man or woman, be a child or a person of age, it makes no difference. You would like to seal with your holy name for one reason, so that your holy people would be able to find your revelations, obtain your revelations, receive them and live by them until they accept your delegated authority over themselves, those that you've sent, those teachers that you've sent. Even hearing your word, they won't be able to understand it or receive it inside to be able to eat it. May your mercy be upon your people and your glory upon your holy ones. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, visit your people with those promises that you've promised from the beginning to dress us into the into your son Jesus Christ who is our new person you said once in the Gethsemane Mount as we are one let them let them be one with us allow our new person to be one with you and that we may be dressed into our new person. We received this by faith and the process has already started because we began to confess with our faith and dress us into our dress ourselves into our new person. We have bowed our heads before you waiting for the movement of the waters waiting till the time that you visit us and show your glory and we till this time not looking at the various trials that we experience we produce the fruit of patience that will have will be sufficient and we will wait till this time you are alive and we will be alive with you we'll be dressed into our new person and not other eyes, but our eyes will see this happen. I believe in this. I believe in your words because you have submitted yourself to your words and wait for them to be fulfilled. I accept this with your nation. In my heart, I rejoice about this. I am glad and I rejoice about this and I proclaim your victory, the victory of your word. And I worship before you, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen